To Redeemer East Side, we're so thankful to worship with you this morning. Whether you are with us in person or you're viewing with us online, welcome. I want to start us off with a thought this morning to consider as we begin worship. Thomas Akempis writes about divine love, and this is what he says. He who loves flies, runs, and is glad. He is free and not hindered. He gives all things and has all things because he rests in one who is high above all and from whom every good flows. So this description of divine love is inviting us into something higher and better than we could possibly imagine. And it's an invitation for all of us, for you and for me. So if you think, I want to fly, but I feel like I'm falling, you're invited into love. If you feel like, I wish I could run, but I'm limping, the invitation is for you. If you've wondered, how could I ever be glad again? He calls you into gladness, and it's through God's divine love. And that's why we're here to worship. So come with me. Let's stand for today's call to worship and encounter divine love. Read with me when it says, all. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are but idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Gently bears us, rescues us. 
Let us pray. Father, we adore you. Father of Jesus Christ and our Father, for you have invited us into your family. We praise you for your mercy and your comfort that you lavish upon us and aid us with help. O oh God, lover of our soul, when you come near, all will rejoice, all will be free, for you are the joy of our heart. You make us glad, you make us fly, you make us run. You are our hope and our refuge every day. We praise you for you endure forever, never changing in the midst of a world of change. You are present and more real than anything in this world and we trust you completely for you are wise beyond our comp comprehension. And we give you all of our concerns, knowing that your will is good and the best for us and for our world. And so we seek you now because we are still weak in love. We need to be strengthened and comforted by you. Come near to us in this worship service. Ignite our hearts to praise you. Open our eyes to see your love and cleanse us in every way so that we may know you well and so that we may be ready to love, strong to suffer, and steadfast to serve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, because our words are inadequate to praise him as he deserves, take this time in silent praise before him. And now let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. now we come to our time of confession. Having looked at God in praise for all of his holiness, we, are see, we see ourselves more clearly. And the prayer that we're about to pray together highlights that even in our silence, in our indifference, in our apathy, we sin against a holy God and against our fellow man. And so read with me this prayer of confession and make it your own, knowing that God is ready to forgive you through Jesus Christ. Read with me. 
Eternal God, in every age, in every nation, you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. Forgive our indifference to your will. You have, you have commanded us to speak, but we have been silent. We'll wait one second. They should catch up with us. You have called us to live faithfully, but we have been afraid. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Keep before us faithful people to follow so that living with... <laughs> I'll go along for us. Follow along in your minds. So that living with courage and love we may work for and inherit the kingdom promised in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so use this time now. Some thoughts may have been prompted in the prayer we prayed together. Use this time of silence now to confess your personal sin to God. For all who put their trust and faith in Jesus, hear these words of assurance of pardon from Isaiah 43. This is what the Lord says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Just love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse?
Jesus says to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This is the good news. In Christ, we are healed, restored, forgiven. The peace of the Lord be always with you. As we continue incorporating the practices of peace into the life of the Redeemer East Side, pass the peace to each other now, whether you're at home, send a text. If you're in the sanctuary, move around, meet someone you haven't met before, and pass the peace. I'll be back in a moment with some announcements. Well, welcome again to Redeemer East Side. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us. Uh, again, I'm Lynn Cook, and I'm the Senior Formation Director here at Redeemer East Side. We want to extend an especially warm welcome to all of you who are new. If you've never been with us before, then please uh, get to know us more. We have volunteers here in the sanctuary as well as online, and feel free to just ask any questions, and we can try to respond and also help get you connected as much as possible. I've got a few important things that you're gonna to wanna to take note of uh, for the coming weeks. First of all, you are not alone if you're experiencing a greater need for care or for practical assistance. And I wanted to let you know that the East Side deacons and deaconesses are here to uh, come alongside you with practical help and with prayer. And because of the generosity of our church, there are special funds right now to those who may be sensing a need to um, participate in counseling. So if you uh, are experiencing that need yourselves, so many of us have had some effects from COVID that are affecting us, then please reach out uh, to the care and assistance line that you see on your screen. And I'll tell you that I personally have benefited so much from counseling, and so I encourage you, if that's something you've been thinking about, reach out. Our deacons and deaconesses are ready to help you. Second of all, with care and assistance, I want to let you know that your generosity to the Disaster Relief Fund has been amazing and has helped us to come alongside many people in need uh, during the pandemic, as well as nonprofits in our city that are directly helping uh, some that were most grace greatly affected. Recently, we were able to use uh, funds that you guys gave and your generosity to help Pagan Christian NGO. And they came alongside families that live in a building that burned down in Jackson Heights, Queens. So we were able to provide meals as well as groceries uh, to, to help them. And that's all because of what you're doing. And so for the long-term needs that are going to continue arising from COVID, what we would like to do is shift our disaster relief funds, that uh, the, some of the remaining funds that were given, into our long-term mercy fund so that we can keep helping most effectively for the long term. So if anyone gave money to the disaster relief fund and has any questions about that shift that we're making, please reach out. You'll see an email at the bottom of this screen. Reach out to us and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Next, 
Everybody loves the marathon, whether you want to run in it or you just want to watch it. It's the 50th marathon, 50th uh, annual marathon this year, and Hope for New York has special spots. So we invite you, if you are interested, there are a few team Hope for New York spots left to run, and you get to raise money for Hope for New York affiliates that are serving those most in need in our city. So if you're interested, apply by the end of July. Next, I want to let you know that our pastor search committee is working hard and they want to hear from you. So you'll be seeing in your inbox coming soon a survey and we need your input. So please give it to us. And the search committee will be here giving you a direct report next week, letting you know the status of what's going on with the pastor search. So be praying for them. Get excited. There's more coming next week. And finally, I want to invite up Sabrina Booth. She is our preschool and children's coordinator, and she's going to give you a special announcement from Children's Ministry. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see everyone here today. Now, normally, I would not be here. I would be upstairs on the fourth floor running our nursery and preschool, and of course it would sound a little different. <laughs> you would hear the screams and the gleeful cheers about everyone learning about the gospel, so it is a pleasure to be here this morning with you all. So church family, I have a question for you, and it does require an answer. So when you're ready to hear the question, give me a thumbs up that you're ready. Excellent, and for you at home, give me a thumbs up as well. Thank you. So this is the question, do you, as a congregation, undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child. Do you? Mm -mm. Let's try that one more time. Mm -mm. Do you, as a congregation, undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? Do you? Yes. Much better, thank you. <laughs> Earlier in the service, we witnessed the beautiful sacrament of infant baptism, little Luella June, Oliver, and Fred. It's, and notice, it's not just the parents that are taking these vows, it's all of you. All of you in the church family are taking these vows. And first, I wanna say this. To our East Side families, we hear you at the children's ministry, we hear you loud and clear how you want our children's classes to relaunch like yesterday. You are done with Zoom, you're done with it. The kids are driving you nuts, I understand. We want to be back just as badly as you. So hold on, we're coming. <laughs> Secondly, I wanna thank all of you in the congregation for the ways that you have either volunteered with us in our children's ministry, how you've prayed for us, even serving with us in our VBS this past week, on behalf of the Children's Ministry, we cannot thank you enough. You have our deepest gratitude. And finally, to you who are members in this congregation, I say this. We, there is a part, there, let me say this. There is a way for you to live out the vow that I just read to you just now. And it's by serving in our children's ministry, becoming a volunteer today. And know that, please know, we need you. We need every single one of you to volunteer in our children's ministry. We cannot relaunch our children's ministry classes without you. It simply cannot be done. And let me say that one more time. We cannot relaunch our children's ministry classes without you. And our children's ministry classes are starting in about three weeks, August 15th, I know, it's coming real quick. And then we're fully really reopen, sorry, relaunch in September. So we need every single one of you to become a volunteer today. Assist our families, become, Teach our kids about the gospel. They need you. We need you. On behalf of the children's ministry, we, are prayerful. we want you guys to prayerfully consider joining us today. Jenny and I will be out in the courtyard. 
If you have any questions about becoming a children's ministry volunteer, come ask us. We want to get to know you. Come say hi. Please don't walk past us because we'll see you anyway. We're going to see you going out the door. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> come say hi. We want to get to know you. Join us. Our families need you. Our kids need you. Thank you so much. reading this morning is from Daniel chapter 3 verses 13 through 29. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego came out from the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn from limb and their house is laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. The word of the Lord. All right, let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come like a fire and burn. Come like a wind and cleanse. Convict.
convert and consecrate our hearts to our great good and to thy great glory. Amen. Well, a couple weeks ago, we began our summer sermon series on the book of Daniel, what we're calling with Daniel and Trials. We recognize that it has been a period of deep sadness and suffering in our world, our country, and our city. The lives that so many of us have known have been turned upside down. We've experienced a public catastrophe, a historic pandemic, alongside growing distrust, violence, and factions in our society. We've had to tackle hard questions about past and present racial injustices, and that isn't even to mention things like we saw last week uh, with the assassination in Haiti last week. And in our own Redeemer Eastside community, we're in the middle of uncertainty ourselves as we search for a new pastor. In the book of Daniel, God's people suffer together. Daniel himself suffers, his friends suffer. We learn in chapter 1 that Daniel has lost everything he knows, his home and the people he once knew, as he is taken from Judah into captivity in Babylon. But Daniel's story is a story about a community of people suffering together. It's not that these individuals have done anything wrong individually. No, in the larger story of the Bible, we learn that it's because God's people together are suffering because they have refused to follow God's ways. So Daniel is a book that looks at the grittiness of this world and asks what God is really up to. How does one come to terms with the promises of God made to his people when everyday life seems to flatly contradict it? In a world filled with so much suffering in 21st century New York City, a lot of us stop to ask, how do I deal with the uncertainties and the challenges I face? How do I find a remedy in a world filled with pain, in a world that feels God forsaken? Where am I going to find God? But it's not the news that usually keeps me up at night, and I doubt it's the news that usually keeps you up at night, or even to ask these questions. No, that happens when your first wife told you that the marriage was over, or perhaps you've put in six or seven hours uh, six or seven days a week in that financial services company that you work at for years, and just when landing that cush promotion, when it's in sight, you receive word from the doctor that a test has come back and it shows something different. Where are you going to find God when your world is falling apart? Today, Daniel 3 calls you to look lower. This is a story for those of us who are exhausted, weary, and ready to give up. It's for those who have been duped into thinking that God is found at the top of the retirement fund or in the startup that reaches unicorn status. It's a story for those of us who think that anonymity means that you don't matter or that you have to be first in order to feel valued. It's for all of us who think that you have to have yourself tied up in a bow before you can be loved. Daniel 3 is a familiar story to many of us. It's a story about three brave heroes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, I feel like I'm going to say those three names in that order a hundred times, so bear with me. So it's a story about three brave heroes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who live in a foreign land and defy the big bad king. And for their courage and their faith, God rewards them by miraculously causing the fire to not touch them. Or at least that's what I thought growing up, but I was wrong. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace isn't a story about three handsome young mavericks who take on the bad guy like Avengers heroes. It's a story about the God who rescues, the God who makes a way when there is no way. Surrounded on every side, but God delivers. And so whether you're on cloud nine right now, or whether you're headed down into the valley, this story is a reminder for you that God meets you where you least expected to find him. God finds you where you least expected to find him. He finds you in the most unexpected of places. This story is a lesson in contrast. In our story today, we have two parties. 
And both are unsettled by some external circumstances. On the one hand, you have Nebuchadnezzar, who looks upward in pride. Then on the other, you have Daniel's friends, who look downward in faith. God sends both of these parties to school, and as we listen along, we might be tempted to only side with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But biblical teaching leads us to see, all of us, to see our own inner Nebuchadnezzars. So let's work through this story under these two headings. So first, where we naturally look for God, and two, where God finds us where we naturally look for God, and two, where God finds us. So, so the first point, where we naturally look for God. The whole book of Daniel unfolds in or around Babylon, which is basically present-day Iraq, and this event is probably happening somewhere around the year 600 BC. Now, Babylon was a political superpower that had begun to expand under Nebuchadnezzar's father, uh, and so once his father dies, Nebuchadnezzar takes the throne, and he has a lot uh, to tend to to maintain this political authority. And like you might expect with any country or kingdom, we know that Nebuchadnezzar faced challenges internally and externally. So in chapter 2, as we heard from last week, we zoom in on a king, uh, and the text says that he was anxious. He has difficulty sleeping. And, and then he is visited in the night by a dream from God that shows him that his empire won't last forever. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? Well, he sees an image or an idol. It's a figure of a person with a head of gold, and the rest of the body is made up of different materials like iron, bronze, and clay. <clears throat> but then a stone that isn't cut by human hands comes along, and it smashes the figure into pieces. And so uh, Daniel interprets the dream, and he says, uh, it is the God of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, who has given you the rulership over all these people, but that will not last. More kingdoms will come and go, but there is coming a kingdom, the kingdom of God, that will last forever and ever. And so Nebuchadnezzar may think that his kingdom, his empire, is the one that's rising to the top, but God is saying through this dream, no, my kingdom is rising to the top. In other words, God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, you are not God. And this is important to remember for our text today because before we can even catch our breath and flip the page to chapter 3, our story today, what do we see Nebuchadnezzar building? That's right, an image, an idol. In his dream, the head was made up of gold. This represented Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter 3, he builds an image, a figure of a person totally plated in gold. And so it's ironic that the first reaction after Nebuchadnezzar praises Daniel for interpreting the dream, it's ironic that the very next thing he does is build an idol. He was challenging God's reminder to him that he is not God. But like all things in life, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. There was good reason for Nebuchadnezzar uh, doubling down. His flight upward had been interrupted. His sense of control and authority had been challenged. So first it was uh, challenged by God in this dream and then by real lived experience. So uh, taking our cue from history, there's a Babylonian clay prism. So think of something sort of like um, a clay cylinder that has a record on it, and it records a revolt within Babylon uh, in the year 594 B.C., it says that Nebuchadnezzar had to put down a revolt himself and even was forced to kill some of his own soldiers to rid the city of the dissenters, and then he demanded allegiance from leaders underneath him. Which brings us to chapter 3. Some people believe this is the background to our story, a tense political struggle where the king regains control and now he is demanding allegiance. And so he feels the need to build a golden image to unify his empire. And this, this idol that he builds, this golden image, it's, it's pretty gargantuan too. The earlier part of the chapter <clears throat> says that it was 60 cubits high. So it was about 90 feet tall, and from side to side, it was about nine feet. So this wasn't standard height for a figure. If you stop to really think about it, it was extra tall and thin. So it may have appeared fairly kind of weird and distorted, maybe even grotesque. So he holds a dedication for this statue, for this large idol, and he commands representatives from all the people he rules to bow to it. Now, 
the Hebrew word behind this word dedication is actually the word used in Ezra to refer to the temple dedication. So Daniel is suggesting that something very religious is going on behind this political act. Nebuchadnezzar is concerned about empire building and making a name for himself. It's political for sure, but the story is exposing how there is something deeply religious because the desires of his heart are what drives his political actions. Pride lies behind his actions where he envisions himself as the one who can control things, who can assert ultimate power and authority, and now Nebuchadnezzar is even moving to resist the warning that God has given him by asking for everyone to submit to him in total allegiance. And so in response to what he sees, he aims even higher. Nebuchadnezzar is looking upward for value, affirmation, and worth. Instead of receiving his place now in humility before God, he has to assert, dominate, subject, He's looking up instead of looking down. Instead of humbling himself and receiving his rule as a gift to bless others, he uses it as an extension of his own ego. And and he'll take down whomever and whatever he needs to take down in order to assert himself. This This is what we call pride. It's on full display right here in the story. When he learns that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down because of their loyalty to the God of Israel, He is filled with a furious rage. And so in verse 15, he arrogantly asks them, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Nebuchadnezzar has assumed the place of the divine. He has ultimate control. His Babylonian religion is only a prop for his power. And to push it one step further, he orders the furnace to be heated seven times more than it usually was. So much so that even the people who throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are consumed by the fire themselves. And so you can see the story is showing us how his maddening destructiveness, how his pride is is destructive. It's pride. And so when Nebuchadnezzar gets unsettled by the dream and by real life, he flees to his pride. And so he looks upward. You and I often look upward in pride. We may not call it that. We may call it something else. We might even be totally self-effacing, but the biblical story shows that when we push God aside, pride lies close at hand. Here's what the British writer Dorothy Sayers says about pride. Whenever we say, whether in the personal, political, or social sphere, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, We are committing the sin of pride, and the higher the goal at which we aim, the more far-reaching will be the subsequent disaster. This is a very real warning for those of us who live and work in New York City and are putting in the hustle to build our careers and dream big. You and I got to ask ourselves, how might we ourselves be seeking an almost godlike status in our capitalist empires? I think, for example, of this uh, Atlantic article from 2019. It was titled, Jeff Bezos' Master Plan, What the Amazon Founder and CEO Wants for His Empire and Himself, and What That Means for the Rest of Us. So the article goes on to explain how with almost religious-like qualities, Amazon's reach is set to be all-encompassing, even going to outer space. So it says this, this is a quote, With his wealth and the megaphone that it permits him, Bezos is attempting to set the terms for the future of the species so that his utopia can take root. We may no longer be living in the days of, you know, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and the Medes battling it out, uh, but we still live in a world where humans are battling it out for money, power, authority, and control, aiming at godlike status in our world. And I know we can all get down with a good Amazon Prime deal. But all of us go to work and set our eyes on building our own empires. And I want to ask you, what does this story warn you of? What does this story tell you? What does it say to you? Pride is basically saying that you can do without God. Sometimes the avenue is work. Sometimes it's public office. Sometimes it's even masked in religious language where God is used as an instrument for our own purposes. 
But one way or another, we make ourselves to be God, which is what idolatry in the Bible is really all about. Our founding pastor, uh, Tim Keller, has talked about how we don't set up gold statues anymore. No, we have other images, idols, and counterfeit gods. We, uh, in the 21st century, use things like money, sex, power as a way to control, to manipulate, and to feel like we are valued. So the problem is that you and I all have our own inner Nebuchadnezzar, who try to look upward in pride and to build our own idols, searching for our own version of a god. But bringing it down to daily life, if you're like me, as I try to manage and make my way through this uh, chaos, uh, this chaotic world, I use anything I can to find control, a career path, a savings account, uh, even friendships, all good things that are gifts from God, but when used as a replacement for God, they become idols. And when we hold them tightly to make ourselves feel more safe and secure and put together, they become addictions. One counselor said this about addiction. Addiction is an attempt to master reality on our own terms, a refusal to live in the world that God has made. And our desire for control is at the heart of it. Our restless hearts demand satisfaction now. We refuse to wait. We refuse to hunger. We refuse to thirst. Created with a relentless desire for God, we attach that desire to something else, something more manageable, more controllable. In other words, addiction is a way of filling that God-sized hole in each of us with something that will never cut it. Nebuchadnezzar's heart was made for that coming kingdom that he dreamed about, that coming kingdom that would never fail, or we might say that his heart was made for the king of that kingdom, and so are you. Where we naturally look for God in our idols and our addictions that make us feel secure, our wealth, our relationships, our power, that's where we think salvation is found. That's where we think God might be found. But Daniel 3 shows us that the true God shows up where we least expect to find him. And that brings us to point two, where God finds us. Like we said earlier, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had lost everything they knew when they were taken into exile in Babylon. But then in chapter two, Daniel interprets the king's dream, and so he gives Daniel and all three of his friends, he gives them a promotion, some uh, pretty nice jobs in government. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but the text says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given uh, authority to oversee affairs in Babylon. And so by the end of chapter two, we are expecting everything to just go superbly for them. And so, uh, but as we know from the story, things aren't going to turn out that way. And so notice what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious, arrogant rage, he commands them to bow down to his golden image, and he asks them in verse 15, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And this question here is really the center point of the chapter. And so when Nebuchadnezzar asks, who is the God who, who can possibly remove you from my hands? You should feel the tension of this battle that is building. Is there one stronger than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace? For their part, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse again and again to bow. And with a collected confidence, they respond to the king, our God is able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we will still refuse to bow to your golden image. Stop to imagine what they might be feeling and thinking in that moment. I imagine after being pulled into exile, into a foreign country with everything taken from them, then ultimately being faced with a prospect of execution, they were perhaps wondering if God was present at all. They had been sent into the wilderness. They had been sent to a place seemingly forsaken by God that was one big setback. Life certainly hadn't gone according to plan for them. I imagine what they often ask themselves leading up to this point is, where is God in the midst of all this? But nevertheless, they refuse to bow, even with a death sentence hanging over their heads. And this God who seems to have been absent so far, the question is, will he make himself known? Will he deliver on his promises? Will he rescue? Now, it's important for a sidebar here for a moment. It's important to stop here just to make a comment because 
this situation might seem so far removed from our current day context as if this could only happen in the ancient world, but I can't help but think uh, of what happened less than a century ago in Nazi Germany. As Hitler uh, was rising to power, he called for absolute allegiance to him, and so even the German churches were reorganized into one central church that blended Nazism with Christianity. Some Christians in Germany, though, uh, recognized that this was at odds with Christianity. And so they uh, put together this thing called the Barman Declaration, and they said in very clear terms, we will not bow to Hitler. We will not swear ultimate allegiance to Hitler. No, Jesus Christ is the one word of God. These people in Germany were modern Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes. And so a question for all of us, how are you being called to bend the knee to a golden image in 21st century America? Maybe it's politically. Maybe it's in business dealings. But ask yourself, what is this saying to you? So back to the central question in our story, is there a God? The question the text is posing is, is there a God who can rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, we know the rest of the story. They get thrown into the furnace that's heated seven times uh, more. It's heated to the max, and we might assume now that all is lost, game is over. Can they? There's no way they could possibly be rescued. And it's just right then when Nebuchadnezzar has to do a double take. He can't believe what he's seeing. And so I'm reading from verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So the three men aren't, they're they're not harmed at all, but there's also an angel clearly sent by God to preserve them. And so the God of Israel has answered Nebuchadnezzar's question. There is a God who can deliver them out of his hands. There is a God who is stronger than he. In fact, it's it's the same theme from the dream that we saw in chapter 2. God is making it plain to Nebuchadnezzar that the kingdom of God is the one that is rising to the top. Or to put it in the words of Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail over the church. So friends, here and now, the kingdom of God is certainly coming. But here's the good news that I want to underscore for each and every one of you as we all stop these days to ask, where is God in the midst of all this? For those of you who have experienced one big setback after another, for those of you who are exhausted, for those of you who have just gotten more bad news, for, say, you parents who are at wit's end because your oldest child is doing one rebellious thing after another and you're ready to give up, for those of you who are wondering where God is, this story calls you to look lower. It's right there at the bottom Right where you feel like God is most absent, that is where he is most present in your life. I love this blessing uh, that a spiritual director wrote. He wrote, May all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness that you may experience the powerlessness and the poverty of a child and sing and dance in the love of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was a post also that made the, uh, the rounds the other day. It was by a singer-songwriter who goes by the name Nightbird. Uh, and I can tell you that I shed a few tears reading this post. And so she tells about the experience of her husband leaving her. That's about the same time that she finds out that she has cancer again. I think she had cancer. she's had cancer three times so far. Uh, She goes on to explain how she's had insomnia, uh, sitting on the bathroom floor, weeping night after night. And so then she writes this, even on days when I'm not so sick, sometimes I go lay on the mat in the afternoon light to listen for him. I know it sounds crazy and I can't really explain it, but God is in there even now. 
I have heard it said that some people can't see God because they won't look low enough. And it's true. Look lower. God is on the bathroom floor. God is found on the bathroom floor. And that's the place where we never expect to find God. I heard someone on a podcast recently say, life sometimes feels like an endless process of being acquainted and reacquainted with your own weakness, failure, and shame, your guilt, and your sin. A process of making you smaller as the years go on. This story right here in Daniel 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it reminds us that God shows up in the place of powerlessness, the place of absence. He shows up in the furnace. As Psalm 138 says, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. He is present where you least expect to find him. In the Bible, God uses God-forsaken places to show you that he won't forsake you. It is tough medicine to swallow sometimes for sure, but this God He prescribes drugs that are unorthodox for most of us to heal us. He uses plain, ordinary things, even difficult and shameful things to bring healing. He uses things like bread and water to remind you tangibly of his love. We had infant baptisms earlier. This God is saying to those babies and to you, remember your baptism before you can put on any other identity. You are marked out as mine. You are loved. You are valued. You belong. You are accepted. God is using ordinary things like these. God is working down in the dirt, down in the ungodlike, while so often we are busy looking up for God. And God even uses a Roman instrument of shame known as crucifixion to bring about reconciliation and healing for the whole world. Did you catch that line from Nebuchadnezzar about the three friends who emerged Uh, the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they emerged unharmed from the furnace. You might just miss it if you don't pay attention. Listen to what he said at the end of verse 28 after he saw what he saw. He said that they, quote, yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Yes, God visits these three friends at the low point, but there is more These three friends stand here as a little marker of how God is ultimately at work in the world in Jesus. Jesus is the true and better Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who yielded up his body rather than serve any God except the God of Israel. Jesus was faithful all the way to the end, even though you and I have been faithless. Jesus lowered himself so that you could be raised. Jesus made himself nothing so that you could have everything. He gave his body over to death so that you might have life. And he gave his body over to the place where God is absent so that you might always experience his presence. Do you see? God is not found way up high in our empires. He is not found at the top of the corporate ladder. He is not found in the places, in the blessings where you and I think to usually look. In those unredeemable situations, the crucified Jesus is bringing about resurrection, and you have to be dead to yourself before you are raised in Jesus. This past year and a half has been a tough one filled with so much suffering and tears. Oh, so many tears. And when I allow myself to to grieve and to think about my own dying, I can't help but think of the lines of this old hymn. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. For those of us who are wondering, where can I find God in the midst of all this? He is calling you to turn from your pride-filled ways and to look lower. He is calling you to look lower even on the bathroom floor. God finds you where you least expected to find him. Whatever you might be dealing with right now, God is leading you right where he wants you, totally out of options, except him alone. He is with you and he is for you. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we are grateful for this story from Daniel. We're grateful for the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their testimony, their, their faithfulness. Lord God, we are most grateful, though, that you are the God who comes down among us and works in the dirt, making a way when there is no way, redeeming and reconciling when all seems lost. And so I pray that you would lead us to ever deeper, greater trust in you, the God of Israel, who can rescue and redeem. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Having received God's word, now we come to the time of offering. Offering is a time where we yield ourselves, like Brandon was just talking about. We yield all of ourselves to God, and we offer all of ourselves to him. It's also a time to offer him our financial gifts. You'll see uh, the link on the screen that you can give a recurring gift or a single gift, and take time now to offer yourself fully to him.
few reminders before the benediction. If you'd like to pray with someone, we have deacons and deaconesses who will be in the front of the sanctuary after the benediction. Please come. There's someone to pray with you. If you are joining us virtually, please call the care helpline number that will be displayed on the screen after the benediction to pray with someone. Second, Jenny will be out in the courtyard to answer any questions about ch children's ministry volunteering. And lastly, please join us after the service for fellowship at Join the Juice at 75th Street and 3rd. Uh, Lynn Cook will be there, will be at the welcome table and, and then departing with, uh, with a group uh, for some fellowship. Please join us. And now please lift up your heads for today's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is with us in the furnace, and the love of God who makes a way where there is no way, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today, this week, and always. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming. See you next week.